Hey Axis and Allies players, the good captain here. Welcome to my sixth video in my 12 part series on Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition 1941 setup. This will be the first strategic video and since Germany's first up, we'll cover the Germans first, obviously. I will be going through what I think is the most ideal opening moves for Germany, as well as purchases, mid and long range strategies. For any of you who are new to my channel, you might be wondering why would I listen to this guy about strategies for any power, let alone Germany? And that's, I think, a great question. So let me resume myself. I have played in the ballpark of 40 or so games, 40 to 50 games in the last year and a half, two years of Axis and Allies Anniversary 1941 setup. And most of these games were played through the AxisAndAllies.org website using AAA. I've played against all kinds of different players, against all kinds of different skill levels. So I think this is a pretty strong resume because it means I've seen a lot of what works, a lot of what doesn't work, and that is what I'm trying to demonstrate in these videos. These are less my strategies and more an amalgamation of what strategies I have seen work. And for anyone who didn't catch the first five videos in this series, there are five optional rules in this game, and I feel they must be calibrated in a very specific way to achieve some kind of balance. Namely, I'll highlight that I do not play with national objectives. I think they cause a terrible imbalance. Please check out that video if you want to see why I feel that way. But uh, there they are, so I'm just going to hold that up here for a second longer. I'll put an asterisk here and say that because the national objective seems to be so popular, I will pay some lip service to it throughout these strategic videos. I won't completely ignore it, but do understand that these strategies assume you're not using national objectives. Okay, so with all that out of the way, let's get to the first phase in Germany's turn, purchasing units. So I've gone ahead and laid out six potential purchase options for Germany's first turn here on my sheet. I'll go over each of these very briefly. First, the top left and the top center. These are the most common purchases that I see when I play others. That's seven infantry and two tanks or nine infantry and one artillery. And the reason I feel that these are the most common is because whether you play Japan or Germany, you're gonna feel what I call a poverty of infantry for the Axis. In other words, your fronts will be infantry light. And so any way to get more boots to the front is going to be a good thing. So the strength of these purchases is the fact that you're building infantry on the first turn and it's going to pay out dividends for you in the mid game when those infantry hit the front. Getting them out early and often is the strong point here. Conversely, these two purchases are the weakest. That's five tanks and two infantry or just six tanks. I think these are the weakest because they don't have enough infantry. And so when you get those heavy hitters up there, you're going to find out how exposed they are. And finally, these two are sort of mid-grade purchases. You know, they both have infantry in them, but uh, they also have a little bit of an offensive kick. This is six infantry, three arty, six infantry, and a bomber. Now, I didn't throw any fighters up here because, you know, you can use your imagination. Swapping out two tanks makes a fighter or two infantry and an artillery makes a fighter, right? So you, you could do that and manipulate the builds a little bit. But the main takeaway here is these are what I see to be the most common. But I don't feel like this is the most ideal build. My preferred build when I play Germany is 10 infantry straight up and save one IPC. And if you want to know why, I'll explain in the place units phase, so you have to stick around to the end of the video. So we'll go ahead and put the purchase in the mobilization zone. That's 10 infantry and save one. And you might be wondering why didn't he have any options for naval units? And I'll just say out of the gate that I haven't found any purchase of naval units to be competitive in any way. And if you're thinking that purchasing an aircraft carrier and putting it south of Norway is competitive, I've got news for you. It's really not. And if you want to hear more about that specific strategy and why it doesn't work, I will discuss it in my 12th video. Just leave a comment if you want to hear more about that. Otherwise, let's go into the combat movement phase. So I'm going to break the combat moves up into two parts. The first is going to be all about the Battle of the Atlantic, and the second part will be all the land combats. That's Operation Barbarossa and what to do as the Germans and later the Italians down in Africa. So first is the Battle of the Atlantic. 
So I'm going to show you two different versions of the Battle of the Atlantic. The first is definitely the most common. It's the one I advocate for. It's the safest, but there's also another that I feel is pretty competitive, although a little bit higher risk. So I'll show you that as well. First, we'll start with the basic battle and that's removing British units in C zone two and C zone six. And how I like to do that is sending both German subs in C zone seven to C zone two, along with the fighter from Norway which will have two movement points left over. And the other is C zone six. And how I like to do this is to send the German submarine in, which is obvious and not so obvious is to send the German cruiser in, the cruiser. Most players like to send in the fighter instead of the cruiser for obvious reasons, but I advocate strongly for the cruiser. And I wanna take a minute now to explain why I think using the cruiser is a more optimal move rather than using the fighter. Out of the gate, the fighter can now be used in Operation Barbarossa on the Eastern Front. We'll get to that in a minute. But more interestingly, it has to do with the fact that really after turn one, these German naval units are just fodder. So how can we maximize the use of these units? And key to this is to point out that these, in air quotes, defenseless transports still need a combat unit of the opposing side to come sink them. In this case, leaving a transport by itself draws off a British fighter or British bomber. These are the only units on turn one that can do the job of sinking this transport. Nothing else is in range and the Russians have no aircraft to speak of to do the job. If you left the cruiser with the transport in C zone five in an effort to protect it, all you're doing is condensing your targets into one C zone for the allies to pick off together. At least this way, the transport draws off one British air unit. Additionally, if you have a little bit of luck as the Germans, you'll have a sub and a cruiser together here, which would really put the Russian player off from thinking about trying to come and do the 50-50 battle against the cruiser by itself. And so you're left with a British player who has many jobs to do. He has to pick off this transport with a fighter. He's got to send air and probably naval units up to dispense with the fodder units in C zone six, rather than do something else he might otherwise want to do. So it, it creates a, a troubling situation for the British. And before we review the battle in C zone two, I want to try to do something different here and give you guys spoilers. So spoiler alert, the percentage chance of victory, loss, and draw for that battle is 93-3-3. 93% chance the Germans win, a 3% chance of a draw, and a 3% chance the Germans lose in this battle, okay? That's using the AAA battle calculator. Let's move to the battle in C Zone 2. For the battle in C zone two, I don't have too much to say. I know there's a might be a question of why didn't you bring the German bomber out of Germany to solidify the win up here? Uh, but that German bomber is absolutely vital in a very key battle in another part of the board on this turn. So we'll get to that in a moment. But one fighter and two submarines is generally speaking enough to do the job up here. And spoiler alert, there is an 84% chance of a German win, a 6% chance of all the combat units being eliminated. That's what a draw means. The transport's still there. And a 10% chance that the British win and destroy all three German units outright. So the other variant of the Battle of the Atlantic goes something like this. We keep the cruiser submarine attack against the destroyer in C zone six, but these submarines will not go to C zone two at all. In fact, we're gonna ignore C zone two. And what we're gonna do instead is split our attack. We're going to send one sub from C zone seven to C zone nine and one sub from C zone seven to C zone 12. But that's not all. We're going to send some help down to C zone 12. The fighter from Norway goes one, two, three and has one movement factor left. Yes, that means he will have to land in Morocco, Algeria. And we're gonna do a dissection of this battle. Don't worry, you'll see why it's not crazy shortly. Another. Uh, fighter is going to come in from Northwest Europe at 1, 2. Okay. Now, what are the odds of this? For those of you who play AAA, this one up here in Season 9 is a no-brainer. This is a 40-20-40. 40% chance that the German destroys both British units. There's a 20% chance that both combat units destroy each other, leaving only a British transport. And there's a 40% chance that the German sub is destroyed 
and destroys nothing in return. This final battle down here in C zone 12 is an 86-5-9. There's an 86% chance of a win, a 5% chance of a draw, and a 9% chance of a loss. Now, for anybody who thinks what I'm doing here with these percentages is a little cheesy, I'll just say that the setup for every one of these Axis and Allies games is always the same. And we, even if you're not using battle calculators, I argue strongly you should know what you're getting into at least on the first round. You so one of the battle. risky drawbacks to this higher risk operation is the fact that one German fighter must land in Morocco, Algeria. It's not the most happy of circumstances. It's very likely that these German units are unavailable to help defend and we'll show you why here in a moment. An infantry and a fighter on its own though are not completely defenseless. If the operation has gone perfectly, then there are no British units except for this battleship transport combination and the destroyer transport combination of the Americans. Both have incentive to attack and both will have disincentive to attack. It's part of the risk. If you're comfortable with that risk, it's a competitive gambit, even at the expense of this fighter. Otherwise, you have my preferred option, which is the standard attack into C zone 6 and C zone 2. At any rate, if you went with option 1, this could be a result you see out in the Atlantic at the end of Germany's first turn. This is a little bit generous to the British. You'll likely have one submarine either in C zone 6 or C zone 2, but I just want to show this as a conservative option at the end of G1 in the Atlantic. Now on to Barbarossa. So as I did with the Battle of the Atlantic, I'm going to show two options out on the Eastern Front that I've seen and I feel are competitive. And I'm gonna start with my preferred method of doing things first. So this is a little bit complex, but here we go. The first thing I like to do is load up two infantry out of Germany onto the transport in C Zone 5 and unload them into the Baltic States. So we'll go top to bottom. Next, I bring in one fighter from Northwestern Europe, so he'll have two movement points left. Next, I move one fighter from Poland to the Baltic States, so he'll have three movement points left. Then I bring two infantry from Poland, as well as one artillery. Finally, I move one armor from Czechoslovakia, Hungary into the Baltic States. The attack on East Poland goes like this. I move two infantry from Poland and two armor from Poland right in, as well as the two armor from Bulgaria, Romania. Finally, the battle in Ukraine is with what's left. Three infantry and an artillery from Bulgaria, Romania, one armor from Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and one fighter from Germany, one, two, three, with one movement point left. So this is my preferred Operation Barbarossa. And there's a couple of themes here that I'm gonna discuss very quickly. The first is that there's an even distribution of combat power. It really is set up to wipe out the Russian screening infantry in one round of combat. At least that's the idea. It's, remember, there's what I call a poverty of infantry. And so one of the priorities, again, is to eliminate all these Russians in the first round of combat, reduce the possibility of second rounds of combat in each of these territories, thereby uh, lessening the chances of German infantry losses. Another strong point to this is that it's very unlikely that the Russians will counterattack. Again, they have no air force on the first turn, and their only counterattack units outside of infantry are a single armor in Russia and a single artillery up in uh, Karelia SSR. So they're not very incentivized to do any kind of counterattack. And these are basically set up in a way to preserve German forces on the Eastern Front. It's highly likely, however, that you will lose at least two infantry and maybe three infantry. If you only lost one as the German player in this little operation, if you copy me, you should consider yourself lucky. If you lost four, you should consider yourself unlucky. But losing two or three infantry is fairly common. We'll say we lose one here, one here, and one here, how about that? This is being slightly generous to the Russians, but this could be a very common 
first turn expectation as the German player. So you might look like that at the end of the turn. I'm now gonna reset the board and show you another competitive option that I've seen other players use. The other option that I've seen that is fairly competitive isn't really worth piecing out. It's better to just describe it. And it has to do with basically sending in just enough forces to clear the Russians out of the Ukraine and to clear the Russians out of East Poland. This is usually done with um, you know, a matching number of infantries and then sending in the fighters to help those infantries clear them out, maybe sending in artillery, whatever. But the main thing is stacking everything up into the Baltic states. Stacking everything up in the Baltic states is important because on G2, you're looking to make the Russians leave Karelia SSR so that you can snag that on the second turn. I know I blasted through that rather quickly, but it's just not necessary, I think, to parse this out. You clear the blockers in Ukraine and East Poland, stack everyone else up in the Baltic states, and then watch, hopefully, the Russians evacuate Karelia on the first turn. And if you're thinking, well, I like that idea, but why not go south because there's more IPCs down here? Well, there are also less German infantry to help you out with that, and the Russians have a four IPC industrial complex. In other words, they can produce four units on their first turn down here. It's just not a great idea to do that. I recommend either going even across the board or heavy north. We'll now move to the third and final segment of the combat movement phase on Germany's first turn, and that's what to do in Africa. Now we get to the third and final segment of the combat move for Germany's first turn, and that is what to do down in Africa. So the move I'm about to demonstrate at this point to me is really the hallmark of a good and experienced player. If somebody does this, I know they've played the game probably many times before. If they don't do this, I feel like they're probably on the other side of the coin. Maybe they're not too experienced because this is just so vital and so, in my opinion, uh, necessary to a very strong opener as the axis that it should be done like this every time you play as Germany in 41. And this is what you're gonna do. You take all three units in Libya and move them into Egypt. Then you're gonna take a armor and an infantry out of France and boat them over to C zone 15 and land them as well so that you end up with two infantry, two armor, and an artillery. But this is still, of course, not enough to do the job. And this is where that bomber that we've been saving comes into play. The bomber out of Germany can reach Egypt for four movement points, so we'll have two remaining. And now we've got a, a very good chance of taking over Egypt. So this battle is a little interesting because the AAA battle calculator has a neat feature where you, you can retreat when there's only air units left and still get the odds. So even if we retreated when we were just down to the German bomber, we still have a 73% chance of winning as the Germans, a 1% chance of losing the bomber if we retreated when there was only a bomber left, and there's a 26% chance of the British winning. And absolutely, you should do this as the Axis. Most times you play out this battle, the Germans will win and have a bomber and an armor unit remaining. Other times there will be only a bomber remaining. And sometimes there is a British fighter remaining uh, and the German bomber flies off. So those are kind of the three most common outcomes. But the main takeaway is, worst case scenario, the British ground units are removed from Egypt. Uh, this means that on Britain's turn, the fighter will, most of the time, fly, or almost all the time, fly off to safety somewhere, leaving Egypt as a walk-in for the Italian player on their first turn. And this is absolutely key, if nothing else, to remove British units out of the center of the board. When these units are gone, the British will only have these two infantry in Transjordan, They'll have two infantry much further away down in the Union of South Africa and the units available to them in India. If the German player fails to do this, these units survive. Let's say the Germans simply reinforce in this C zone. You are going to see the British evacuate Egypt and fall back to 
Anglo-Egypt Sudan. So yes, it's very likely you'll capture Egypt on turn one, but those British units will escape and they will cause an, a massive headache for you in the mid and late game. I strongly encourage competitive players of the Anniversary 41 setup who are playing as Germany to always do this attack. You could do any rendition of Operation Barbarossa that you like or any Thing you want to do over in the Atlantic really there's a lot of uh, leeway to paint the picture you want to paint but I highly recommend always making this G1 attack into Egypt and now we move to the non-combat movement phase of the German turn so we'll assume the British have survived this battle with a fighter intact and we as the German player are declaring a retreat with the bomber with two movement points there's really only one safe place to go and that's Libya so we'll land there and then we'll uh, join up with the Morocco Algeria infantry on the east front we're going to return our fighters the fighter in Ukraine only has one movement point left so it will go to Bulgaria Romania the two fighters in the Baltic states these are both very important one needs to move to Germany with two movement points left over and the other moves to France one two three the last fighter, the one out in C-Zone 2, has to return to Norway. So that takes care of our air units. In Finland, Norway, we're going to pull one infantry out of Finland, leaving a blocker, and reinforce Norway. In France, we're going to reinforce with one more infantry out of northwestern Europe, as well as the anti-aircraft gun in Germany. Remember that we are playing with the optional rule, escorts and interceptors. This means that fighters can help fend against strategic bombing raids. Finally, we're going to move the artillery and infantry from Germany into Poland. That's it for the non-combat movement phase. We'll go ahead and place our units, 10 infantry into Germany, and then we will collect income. We collect 35, that's 31 plus the four IPCs from the new acquisitions. We also have an IPC left over, so at the very least, on Germany's first turn, you can expect 36 IPCs. Keep in mind that this will be 38 IPCs if you manage to secure Africa. And now I'm going to pick up where I left off about my 10 infantry purchase. And other than the points I already made about there being a poverty of infantry. I'll just point out that the maximum amount of units that Germany's industrial complex can build is 10. It's a 10 IPC territory, therefore you can only build 10 units in this game. So you really wanna maximize that ability and you really want to build at least eight infantry per turn because not only will the East Front demand infantry from you, but the West Front as well. France will start to need more than just the two infantry fighter an anti-aircraft combination it currently has. So you'll need a very robust amount of infantry being produced every turn. I like to try to produce nine infantry per turn and then throw on a core unit or what I call core units. And that's either an armor or a fighter, generally speaking, sometimes a bomber. So I'll just point out that our build next turn could be eight infantry and a fighter for 34 saving two. It could be eight infantry and two tanks, and we'll have the same sort of uh, leftover money. Um, if we had captured Egypt, we could do nine infantry for 27 and a fighter with one IPC left over, right? So there's some fun options in there, but the main takeaway is to really be consistent about building a very healthy amount of infantry, and I'd say at least eight per turn. I'll speak a little bit now about mid and long range strategies. On the G2, you're going to immediately feel the poverty of infantry that I spoke about earlier. Russia has way more infantry than you do, so you're going to basically stall on G2. It's going to be difficult for you to drill forward, and if you do, it's too soon, and you will pay the price in a Russian counterattack. What you should do is try to take a knee, and instead destroy the blockers if the Russians were nice enough to leave you some, or uh, blitz the vacant spaces. And you're doing this to wait for reinforcements coming up from Poland and especially from Germany on your from your first turn build. 
In the West Front, again, yes, you'll need more troops out here and you'll keep an eye on that. Just keep in mind you have the Italians who can help out by sending infantry and armor out there. And if it looks a little thin in France this turn, don't worry, the British have a lot of work to do. They have to send something in to get your transport, they have to send something to get your uh, cruiser, and they've got other options as well. Africa, France, Northwest Europe, Norway, they really have a lot of options and not enough units to do everything they want. The mid to long game strategy as the German player is, and this is key, preserve your force on the Eastern Front and don't get hasty and try to drill into Moscow in the early part of the game. Japan needs a few turns to spin up. Just preserve your army over here. Don't put them at risk of being destroyed. It's better to stay alive and a threat and bug light Russian and allied forces on the Eastern Front and give Japan, which is an overpowered player in this game, the maximum opportunity to really expand and put a ton of pressure on Russia's East Front. A couple of final points here and then we will recap and close this video. If you're playing with national objectives, you will now qualify for two out of your three and that'll boost your IPC count by 10. Another note is that Finland and Norway really cannot be expected to be held much past turn two. So brace yourself for that. There's really no strategy that I've seen that's competitive that uh, involves holding onto those two for any length of time. So we'll recap now. This was my German strategic video for the Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition 1941 setup Germany. I covered purchasing options and various combat moves in the Atlantic, on the Eastern Front, and the what I consider very vital for a competitive player attack into Egypt. We also discussed mid and long range strategies, namely producing infantry and reinforcing both the Western and Eastern fronts. And specifically in the Eastern front, preserving your army until the Japanese empire is up and running. So that's it for my German strategic video. Let me know what you think about my strategy or share your own in the comments section below. Thank you for watching this. All the best from the good captain and bye bye.